praise God and thank you for tuning in to the broadcast. We certainly want to go before the Lord with prayer and, and pray that and believe God to meet all of your needs according to his riches and glory. Gracious and awesome God, we want to thank you for this day. For this truly is the day that you made and in it we should be glad and should rejoice. We thank you for all those that have tuned in to the broadcast. We pray that through the message and through prayer that their needs be met. We certainly pray for their needs. Father, we ask in the name of Jesus that every need that our viewers may have, that it be met this day in the precious and awesome name of Jesus. If it's healing they need, we pray in the name of Jesus that the nail scarred hands of Jesus touch their body. We pray in the name of Jesus that deliverance come to their home today. We pray, Lord, if there's a financial need, if there's an emotional need, if there's a mental need, we pray in the name of Jesus that that need be met this day. We rebuke every spirit that have come against them. And we give you praise on and thanks, Lord, for meeting that need. Of course, you heard me say on several occasions through the prayer, that Jesus would meet your needs. I'm a Jesus man. I'm a Jesus freak. I love Jesus. And I don't mind saying it's because of Jesus that I stand here before you today. And I thank God for my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I know no other name on the heaven whereby we can be saved except the name of Jesus. And within that name, salvation not only means for the spirit man, but it also means for the soul and for the body. I want to talk to you today about our subject matter, how to deal with bad news. How to deal with when you hear bad news. You know, I, I ride motorcycles and I love riding motorcycles and I just want to give you an example. One of my our riding partners was riding from Florida and on his motorcycle he had a flat tire and of course at the speed he was traveling he was killed and when we got the news of course that was bad news there was nothing could be done about it but I received some bad news the other day with one of our loved ones who uh, was struck by a terrible illness and so when we got that bad news I immediately said to my wife let's pray let's believe God you know so often and I've experienced it in the past that when you pray for people who or sick or who have come down with a terrible illness not in every case but in some cases after you pray for them the situation turned to the worst and I don't know exactly why that happened but I know within these scriptures the word gives us examples of things that happen you know Jesus after he was tested the Bible said the devil left him for a season after he went through his 40 days and or 40 nights of being tested by the enemy and Jesus uh, 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 beat him up with the word of God and everything that the enemy brought to him Jesus said it is written and let him know it is written in the word of God and Jesus actually uh, uh, beat him every which way but but uh, you could hear every which way you could think of Jesus uh, beat the devil but the scripture said he left him the devil left Jesus for a season which meant he was coming back so, so often when we pray for people, the enemy try to make a last stand against them by coming back at them. So, and so I want to deal with this subject matter because as I said to many people, even if the situation turned to the worst, don't let go of your profession of faith. Continue to stand on what God's word says and, you know, and, and, and make your stand. And that Paul said, after having done all to stand, continue to stand. So we want to look at that particular, uh, we want to look at this subject matter. How to deal with bad news or how to deal with a bad report when you get it. Then there's some bad news you get. It's, uh, uh, in some instances, you can't do nothing about it. Like our friend who was killed on the motorcycle. When we got that news, of course, he had already been uh, declared dead and everything and this was happening right outside of Florida. Nothing we could do about that. But as, my, as I was saying, my loved one, when she was told 
she had cancer, of course we could believe God for her and we could uh, address that terrible illness and believe God by standing on the word of God knowing that God said by his stripes we were healed. So we want to look at that in this in the book of Mark, the fifth chapter beginning at the 21st verse. This story is where Jairus uh, comes to Jesus and we want to read it so that we'll, uh, you'll have the opportunity to look back at it in the scriptures. I don't just want to give you my words but I want to look at the word of God. The scripture said these stories are written for our example and our admonition. So we want to certainly look at how Jesus handled the bad news that came to Jairus because that's going to give us an insight into how we are to look at or to handle bad news when we get it or when we hear it. So we're going to start right there at the 21st verse of the 5th chapter of Mark. And it says, And when Jesus was passed over again by ship unto the other side, much people gathered unto him, and he was nigh unto the sea. And behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet. And besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter, lie at the point of death. I pray thee, come, lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed, and she shall live. This is a beautiful story. Jairus lay out his expectation that Jesus, if you come to my house and lay hands on her, I know she's going to live. And Jairus had already made his declaration of faith and was standing on the word of God. And as Jesus uh, turned to go toward Jairus' house, he was interrupted. And we're going to see how this story plays out. Sometimes Jesus seemed like he's being delayed from coming to bring you your answer or for you to make your full recovery or to get out of the situation that you find yourself in. It seemed like he's don't, you know, one of my old friends used to say, a preacher friend of mine, he's going home to be with the Lord now. He said, Larry, Jesus is the slowest man that I know that's always on time. And I said, uh, my brother, you are so right. It seemed like he coming slow, but when he do come, he's right on time. And he always is right on time. And we're going to see that as this story plays out. And the scripture said, and Jesus went with him and much people followed him and thronged him. And a certain woman which had an issue of blood 12 years, and most of you have heard these stories many times. And I'm not going to uh, go through the whole story, but we know that as Jesus was on the way to Jerry's house, he was interrupted by the crowd thronging upon him. But there was a certain woman within that crowd that had an issue of blood for 12 years. And she's going to come and she's going to touch the hem of his garment and she's going to make it whole. And as we see the story playing out, she comes up behind and touches the hem of his garment. And the Jesus noticed that virtue leaves out of his body. And that word virtue uh, uh, in the Greek is deutimus, which meant power left out of him. And he immediately turns around. He says to the disciples, who touched me? Who touched me? And all of the disciples begin to say, man, Jesus, the crowd is strong in you. And you ask that question, who touched me? But Jesus knew who touched him because he knew virtue went out of it. And I'm going to tell you something. Anytime you pray for people, anytime you find yourself wrestling with demons all day, you need to always go before the Lord and ask the Lord to refill your spirit refill you up because when you deal with uh, 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 spirits and when you deal with sickness and when you find yourself praying for folks, virtue leave out of you. And so when you feel your tank getting empty, you need to always get along with God and say, Lord, fill me up or begin to praise God. So God will refill you up because we notice that when the woman touched Jesus, virtue left out of him. Power came out of him. That's how he knew that somebody been healed. Somebody has touched me with faith and they received their healing. So he began to ask the question. Finally, the woman came forth and began to confess what had happened to her. And Jesus said unto her, Daughter, thy faith have made thee whole. Go in peace and be 
hold of that plague. Now Jairus was standing there hearing all this. So his faith was being built up because now he see somebody else who had a need has been cured or been made whole. So that encouraged Jairus. I'm sure standing there listening to that, that encouraged Jairus even though he was like, come on Jesus, my daughter is dying. I need you to hurry up and get home with me. I'm sure he was still anxious to get home even though he heard that good news of what happened to the woman. But yet he was still in a hurry to get home because his daughter was dying and he needed Jesus to stop what he was doing and come on, let's go to my house. And so uh, while he when after Jesus finished telling the woman to go in peace, she's been made whole of that plague. Then here comes the bad news. While he yet spake, that 35th verse says, there came from the ruler of the synagogue house, certain which said, thy daughter is dead. Why trouble thou the master any further? Do you see it playing out? This story, this is a beautiful story. In, tell, in showing us how Jesus is going to deal with the bad news that Jerry was receiving or the bad report. And the same way Jesus deals with this uh, bad news is the same way you and I got to approach when we hear bad news. Even when you go to the doctor and the doctor don't give you a favorable report or even if your loved one is at the hospital and the doctors meet with you and give you a negative report. You got to take that, you got to handle that the same way Jesus is finna deal with this negative report that Jairus is getting. You got to make sure, the Bible said these things were written for our admonition and our example as I said a minute ago. So we have to make sure we stay in line with thus said the scriptures. Oh, you may want to fly off the handle and say things are looking bad, but you got to do it like the Bible said do it. This is the only foundation you and I can stand on, and that's this foundation here. Anything else is sinking sand. We got to stand on the, the, uh, this foundation. And, and while he yet spake, there came one from the ruler of the synagogue house, and how certain which said, thy daughter is dead. Why trouble thou the master any further? As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he saith unto the ruler of the synagogue, Be not afraid, only believe. Do you see what Jesus said? Jesus interrupted. He didn't give Jairus a chance to say one word. He said to Jer he said himself, Jairus, be first of all, be not afraid. He didn't, he didn't let him open his mouth. His friends would tell him, don't trouble the master any further. Your daughter done passed. She's expired. She's dead. You might well let it go. She's gone. Jesus hearing all that come right in before Jairus opened his mouth. And I want to share a, a number of scriptures that gives us an understanding of why Jesus did not let Jairus say one word. Number one, over in Proverbs 18 and 21, the scripture said, death and life are in the power of the tongue. You may not believe it. You may say, well, words are cheap. They don't have any meaning. You're going to have what you say. The scriptures is not going to change for you and I. Just because we don't believe it, that don't mean it don't work. Just like we can't see gravity, but I guarantee if you go up on this building where I'm standing in this church and you walk off this building, you may not believe in gravity, but I guarantee you will hit the ground. Because gravity works regardless of what you and I think, regardless of what color you are, regardless of the, uh, how much money you got or your status in life. There are certain principles in this life that work whether we believe them or not. They still are at work. And the scripture said death and life is in the power of our tongue. And just as sure as the, the uh, wise man said it, you better, we as Christians better start standing on it and watch our words. David said this, he said, Father God, put a watch at my mouth. Help me to govern whatever I say. Jesus said, don't let certain words come out your mouth. 
He said, by your words you shall what? Be justified, and by your words you shall be condemned. As Christians, even the sinner, the person that don't know God, his words will affect him. I remember some years ago when Jimmy the Greek was, uh, was a pronosticator. Uh, if you don't mind me throwing this little example in, Jimmy the Greek made a statement about the big young black books that play football. And his statement wasn't that negative, but it had a negative connotation. That one, uh, 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 a day later that Jimmy the Greek was removed from his half a million dollar salary job for the words he said. You know, we may as Christians think that our words don't have meaning, but they have meaning. That's when you and I must be careful on what we say. Even our president must be careful with what he said because his words have authority, they have power. You know, Alan Greenspan some years ago, he, I heard him make the statement, I never give interviews. And they asked him, why you don't give interviews, Alan Greenspan? Because he was over the, 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 uh, the Federal Reserve Bank. And he said, when I said certain things, my words changed the whole financial landscape. So I have to be careful with whatever I say. Well, I'm telling you as a Christian, you better be like Alan Greenspan. You, we need to start watching every word we say. Why? Because death and life still presides in our tongue whether we believe it or not. We may take it just careless that sticks and stones may break my bone, but talk don't hurt me. We need to recalibrate and rethink those words because words do hurt you. They hurt us every day because you're going to live and have by what you say. Mark 11, 23 says this. Have faith in God. For verily I say unto you, whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast in the sea and shall not doubt it in his heart but shall believe that those things which he said shall come to pass he shall have whatsoever he said we're gonna have whatever we say that's when jesus didn't let jarius say one word in reference to what he, this men were telling him about his daughter jesus didn't let him say nothing jesus didn't even want to give him the chance or the opportunity to own his mouth so Jesus took the conversation over and said, Jairus, don't be in fear. Only believe God. Only believe what you've already stated is going to happen. That's going to happen. We got to get serious on our words, saints. You know, we got to be careful on what we say. Because that scripture says, whatsoever you say, you're going to have it. Have faith in God, for whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea, and shall not down his heart, but shall believe that those things which he said, not what your mother said, not what your father said, but what you say shall come to pass. You shall have whatsoever you say. We're going to have what we say. Whether believe, believe it or not, we are having what we say right this day. We are having what we say. James 3 and 10. We want to turn now because James also talks about what we have, what we say. I want to just turn in, just read what James said about uh, uh, our words. And so that we as Christian, you know, you said I've heard that before and I know you probably have. But it's always good to hear it again. Peter said this to the disciples, to some of the group he was ministering to. He said, I want to stir up your pure mind by way of remembrance. In other words, I want to bring back to your mind, to your conscious mind, about the things you've already heard and already been studying. Why? Because we need to ever keep them before. You know what God told the old saints? He said, write this, the law in your palm of your hand. Write it on your forehead. Why? So it can always be before your eyes. We need to always make sure our eyes and mind is on the scripture. And that's what uh, 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 Peter told us of uh, one group there. So we want to look at James and see what James said 1 through 10. It says this, my brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive a greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in words, the same as a perfect man and able to bridle the whole body. Behold, and he gives this illustration 
on how powerful our tongue is. He used this illustration by uh, uh, talking about the bit that's put in a horse's mouth. And he talks about with this uh, bit and with this uh, uh, bit you can turn uh, the most powerful horse regardless of what size. And you know I've seen those Clydesdale horses. There are some huge horses. I mean the biggest horses I've ever seen are those Clydesdale horses. But James gives this illustration on how to even turn that huge horse any direction you want to turn him in simply by that bit that's in his mouth. And then he talks about ships. He talks about how great ships are, how large they are. Now I've uh, been on cruises and one of the last cruises we were on, we were on one of the largest ships that had been built. And that ship would hold about 7,000 people. But as huge as that ship was, uh, the bit, the, uh, not the bit, but the rudder, the rudder that stirred that ship is not that large, but that rudder is able to stir that ship through the fishes of storms. That rudder is able to guide that ship in the direction that the captain wanted it to go. And we are the captains of, of this ship, of this house. And that little rudder in our tongue, James said, it can change the course of nature. That's what this whole James 3, 1 through 10 talks about. The tongue and how uh, this tongue, this little fire in our mouth can set on course the course of nature. But James is saying we can change our course. We can change the direction we are going in simply by using our tongue in the right way. The scripture said let a man speak as of what? As of the oracles of God. We need to make sure we say about ourselves and about our situation as well as when we speak of our families and loved ones. We need to speak in line with what the word of God said. Regardless of what we see, regardless of what the devil put in our mind, we need to make sure we say what does say the word of God. Regardless of how your children act, they may act contrary to the way you want them to act, but you need to speak over them the blessings of God. You need to speak over them how you, God sees them. And, and you need to quote how God sees them. And if you believe God's going to save them, you need to quote, I thank God for my children being saved. I thank God for my children being delivered. Why? You are saying you are calling those things that be not as though they were. You calling them as God see them. Because God didn't see you uh, 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 and messed up. He knew you were, but God called you according to how he saw you. God saw you as a preacher. God saw you as a prophet. God saw you as an evangelist. God saw you as a, as a, a deliverance man of God. And that's how God sees us now. And God is not looking at the bad in you. God is looking at all the good he can bring out of you. And we need to speak as of the hours of, of God. As a matter of fact, the scripture said, let your words be what? Season with salt, that they administer grace to the hearer. You need to have your words uh, full of grace, not full of a negative connotation, but full of grace. And James said it. How can bitter water and sweet water come out the same fountain? We need to make sure our words are uplifting, exalting, and, and, and blessing folks rather than cursing folks. And if you don't know Jesus, you need to get to know him. Why? So he can help you speak words that are befitting you and who you are. Praise God. Yes, our words are powerful. That's the reason Jesus didn't let Jairus say one word. Simply because when we look at what James said about our tongue, it can change the direction the way God wants us to go. I want to look at something else too that will give us an indication or why we have to be careful with what we are saying. And the reason Jesus, again, didn't let James say anything. I want to look at one other group of scriptures. And that's in the book of Luke. Of course, it's a beautiful story. I'm going to be reading it out of the NIV. And we're going to start about the 11th verse in the book of Luke. And this is the angel that appears to Zechariah. And we want to see what the angel said to Zechariah. This will further give us an understanding of why Jesus didn't let Jerry say anything. And why it's so important for us as Christians 
to be careful when we hear bad news or get a bad report. Before we open our mouth, I pray that this lesson, this, this lesson that we're ministering uh, uh, will help you and guide you through how you uh, react to the news that you may get. We know that America now is dealing with a number of things that are not going right. We're dealing with COVID. We're dealing with uh, financial uh, downfall or downturn in the economy. A lot of folks are not working. I understand there are 10 million people on the verge of being put out of their home. Uh, 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 the COVID numbers are skyrocketing going up. But we as Christians, we can change a lot of this. We can change a lot of this by beginning to pray and about beginning to say the word of God over this situation, over this uh, creation that we're living in. We are the church. We are the body of Christ. We got to start talking to this COVID spirit. We got to start coming against that sickness or that uh, plague that has hit the land and all the people that are in a hospital. You know, as I pray every night, God encourages me to speak against that terrible plague that has come on the land. And I call it out and I declare and decree that people that are going into the hospital with COVID, they will come out alive. They won't come out in a body bag. You said, Brother Jackson, a lot of folks are coming out in a body bag. And what you say about that? I'm not going to say anything about that. There's nothing I can say about that. And there's nothing you can say too much about it. But we got to approach that the same way Zach, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego approach situation. You know, Shadrach and Abednego told the king, they said, King, when the, the king told them if they don't bow to the image, that they was going to be thrown into the fiery furnace, they said to the king, King, we not bound. And you got to say to, to the devil when he say, Well, what if some don't? What if they don't get healed? What if the victory don't come? You got to say to the devil, this same thing Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said to the king. They said, king, we want you to know this one thing. We ain't bound. Now, our God is able to deliver us. But whether he deliver us or not, we want to let you know we ain't bound. So if you want to throw us into the furnace, you go right ahead. And our God is able to deliver us from the furnace. We letting you know that now. But if he choose not to, it's going to be all right still. And we got to tell the devil the same thing. Hey, I believe God. I'm standing on the word of God. My God is a healer. His son died on the cross over 2,000 years ago. And the scriptures say he was wounded for my transgression, bruised for my iniquities. The chastisement of my peace was upon him, and by his wounds ye were healed. I'm standing on that. But if my God choose not for me to come home rather than to stay here healthy, well, and sound, so be it. I'm still not going to stop believing the word of God. I'm still not going to change my confession of faith. I'm healed by his strike. I am delivered by his strike. I have peace because of his wounds. I have he was wounded for my transgression. He was bruised for my iniquity. The chastisement of my peace was upon him. All that's still the same. Why? I believe God. I'm going to stand on the word of God. And if I go down, I'm going to go down believing the word of God. Amen. And that's how we got to approach that. We got to approach it letting the devil know. If our God decide not to deliver us, we are not going to stop believing our God. Because our God is God. And beside him, there is no other God. There's no other God I know. There may be others that you consider God, but I believe in the one and only true God, and his name is Jesus Christ. You may say his name is Yahshua, and that's okay too, but his name is Jesus Christ, and that's who I'm going to stand on. And as Paul even said, after having done all this, stand, keep standing on what? The word of God. Everything else is going down but the word, and we as Christians got to get back on the word of God. We've gotten so far off the word of God, I don't understand it. Folks are mad because their candidate, and I'm not going to get political, their candidate didn't win. Or they mad because their candidate lost. 
We are not to stand and put our trust in man. We are to put our trust in God. You shouldn't be mad because the person you wanted to go into the White House didn't make it. Why? You, your trust wasn't in him anyway. It was in God. That's where it should have been. That's where my trust needs to be, in God. Regardless to who stayed in the White House, we better trust God. And we mad because we say our candidate didn't get in there. No, I'm not mad. I'm not mad. I'm okay because my candidate still is on the throne. He had left the throne and he said he'd neither sleep nor slumber. But his eyes go to and fro the earth looking for a man or a woman whose heart is leaning toward God or perfect toward God. That's what I'm going to stand on. I'm going to stand on Jesus, my Lord and Savior. I'm going to stand on the word and that's what you ought to stand on. We need to get our trust out of this system, out of the government. You can't trust in man. The Bible says, woe to the man who lean on the arm of flesh. We can't get caught up in leaning on man. We got to lean on Jesus Christ. We got to lean on the word of God. That's the only thing we can lean on. Let me get right over here into the scripture over in the book of uh, Luke and I'm reading it out to NIV. And this is what it says. This is all in relationship to why Jesus didn't allow Jairus to say anything. And you may need to stop saying a lot of negative stuff you're saying too. You say, oh, it don't bother me. Yeah, may not. But you got to remember, Rome wasn't building a day. Your house wasn't building a day. You're going to keep building that house. And one day it's going to come back to hurt you. You know, I love listening to those old preachers like Lester Summerall and R.W. Schambach, T.L. Osborn, and uh, some of the other ones that I know of, Hayes and Dad Hagen. And I was listening to Dad Hagen tell his story one time. He said that some of his members had came to him, and I think I got, hope I got the story right, but this is really the gist of it. He said they asked him to come pray for this young man, one young middle-aged guy. And Daddy Hagen said, yeah, I'll, go, I'll come pray for him. And so he got there to pray for the man, and God told him, don't pray for him. He said, Lord, he said, God never had said don't do that to him. God had never told him, don't pray for anybody. But he said when he got ready to pray for the gentleman, God said, don't pray for him. It's not going to do any good. And he said, Lord, I got faith. They believe God that you'll heal him. And he said, this is what God told him. He said, this man, far grandfather died before he reached the age of 50. His father died before he reached the age of 50. And he'd been all his life saying, I'll never reach the age of 50 myself. Because my grandfather died before he reached the age of 50. My daddy died before he reached the age of 50. And Daddy Hagen said, God told him, said he already established a principle in his life that he will not reach the age of 50. And Daddy Hagen said he didn't pray for him. And the man died a couple of weeks or several weeks before his 50th birthday. You may not believe your words have power, but they will one day come home to roost with you if you continue to quote these negative words. We got to begin to watch what we are saying. We got to be careful of what we are saying. We got to become the stewards over what we are saying. Because by your words, you're going to be justified. And the scripture said, by your words, you shall be condemned. So let's be careful. Let me get on and read this scripture. I've started several times, but the Lord keep giving me more. So I, let me get on so we can uh, begin to uh, get to the meat of this sermon, which we are in getting some good stuff now. Uh, the 11th verse of the first chapter of Luke, and it reads, Then the angel of the Lord appeared to him. This is Zechariah. He was doing the office of the priest and the angel of God appeared to him standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said unto him, do not be afraid. You know, I'm not going to stop here at fear, but we'll deal with fear later on down. But fear is one of the things that the devil always throw it out, throw at us. You and I. He throws fear at us to get us 
off of faith or to get us in the realm of doubting or get us in an area of doubt. And, 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 and he was, but the angel said unto him, do not be afraid. Zechariah, your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son. Now, Zechariah been praying. Lord, I want a child. And the angel came to tell him, your prayer has been heard. And this is what's going to happen. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son. And you ought to give him the name John. He will be a joy and a delight to you. And many will rejoice because of his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or any other fermented drink. And he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth. Many of the people of Israel he will bring back to the Lord their God. And he will go before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah. To turn the hearts of the fathers to their children. And the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous. To make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah asked the angel. And he'd been praying all along. Like we go and pray for our loved ones who are sick. Who have been afflicted with a disease or heart trouble or a brain tumor. Or various illness, kidney failure. Uh, 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 struck with pancreatic cancer or leukemia or AIDS or diabetes uh, various diseases that we have in the land you know I heard one theologian say Jesus received 40 stripes save one and he said this he said there are 39 major diseases in, a, in the world and all the other diseases spring from these 39 well, Jesus, the scripture said Jesus received 40 stripes to save one. In other words, 39 stripes to heal for every major disease. There's a stripe Jesus had provided for the healing of that disease. And every other disease that sprang from that disease, God have already covered you. God have already made it a way for you to be delivered and healed and walk free from sickness, disease, and infirmities. Let's go on. Zechariah asked the angel, how can these things be? He asked him, let me just say this again. He said, how can I be sure of this? That's what Zechariah asked the angel. How can I be sure of this? I am an old man. My wife is well along in years. This is what Zechariah is asking. He's similar to Abraham and Sarah. The same scenario looks similar to that scenario that's being played out but under different circumstances and God is going to handle it different and we're going to see how the angel handle Zechariah the angel answered him I am Gabriel I am Gabriel man Zechariah I am Gabriel I stand in the presence of God and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happened. Because you did not believe my words which will come true at their proper time. This is what the angel Gabriel tells Zechariah. Because he recognized Zechariah don't believe what I'm telling him. And because he don't believe it, if I let him keep running his mouth, he'll go out here and not stop what God is trying to do. But he will hamper it. He will hinder it. He might even delay it. Why? Because that, uh, his words will have power. His words will license those enemies of God to effect change in what God want to do. Because so often God want to do things in our life, but our words. We, the scripture says this. The angels of God encamp round about those that fear God. And they are sent forth to minister unto us who are heirs of salvation. They are hearkened to the voice of God. In other words, what's the voice of God? When we quote, I'm healed by his stripes. It's like Jesus quoting the word. 
because what? We're quoting the word of God. Those angels adhere to the word of God. So when they are encamped round about you, they are there for the purpose to hear you quote the word of God and to carry out the assignment of God's word. They hearken to the voice of God. In other words, they hearken to the voice of your words when it is quoting the word of God. But let me say something to you. The same as the angels of God encamp round about you. The Bible said there are familiar spirits that also want to hang around you to get familiar with you, to hear you quote negative stuff and try to bring that to pass. Why? Because you license them to do what they can do against you. You say, I'm like, oh man, this is flu weather coming up now. Oh, I catch the flu every time. And those spirits set out to do just that, to make sure you catch the flu this year or get pneumonia this year. Everything you say, like the man said, my daddy didn't reach the age of 50. My grandfather never reached the age of 50. I won't reach the age of 50. And the enemy was sitting on ready saying, we gonna do everything we can to make sure you don't reach the age of 50. Even though Daddy Hagen said, God, I know you's a healer, and I know if I lay hands on him, he'll be healed. All that was good. But it couldn't go over his will. It couldn't go override the will for his life. And he had established that in his life that I'll never reach the age of 50. How many of you out there in the viewing audience have already established some things in your life? You know, one of the things I was listening to, uh, and that was Joel Osteen, and I listened to other preachers too. And I heard him quote another day, he said, Lord, let the blood of Jesus. He was telling everybody to quote along with him, and he said, let the blood of Jesus destroy every negative seed that have been planted in me from the time I was a child even to now. And I thought about that and I said, that's true. That's a good, that's a good word to pray. Why? Because so much negative stuff you hear when you're a child. You hear a lot of good stuff too, but you also hear a lot of bad stuff. You hear a lot of stuff like you ain't gonna be nothing. You're gonna be just like your daddy. He wasn't nothing and he, you gonna grow up and be like him, nothing. And so you hear all this stuff. You hear stuff, the, the women hear stuff, oh, you're just going to be a slut like so-and-so. You're going to be like her, or you're going to be like uh, that woman or that man. So all of this negative stuff you hear from a child, and it begins to shape who you are. It begins to shape you and mold you and make you into some that God had not ordained for you to be. When God brought you on the planet, he brought you on the planet for a purpose. You have a purpose for why you're here. Just like these chairs that I'm looking at, they have a purpose in this, in this building for folks to sit in and to relax in and to be comfortable while they hear the word of God. They have a purpose and God don't bring anything on the planet without it having a purpose. And you have a purpose. You have a destiny. And don't let words that you say or what other folks may even say about it, you interrupt what you know God has planned for your life. You ought to be successful. But let me finish reading. The angel told Zachariah, because of your unbelief, I'm going to make sure you don't say nothing to interfere with what God is doing in your life. John the Baptist is going to be born. And his mouth was closed tight until the day Sarah, I mean his wife, gave birth. When Elizabeth gave birth, that's when his mouth opened up when he asked what his son going to be named. And, he, and the people said, we're going to name him Zechariah. Uh, uh, Elizabeth said, no, his name going to be John. He said, none of your kin folks are named that. She said, that's okay, that's what his name going to be. And when they asked the father, he wrote it down on the people's paper, his name going to be John. And that's when God unloosed his tongue. Why? You free to talk now. God done brought to pass what he had ordained to come to pass. Now you can't interrupt it because it done took place. And that's what Jesus was Stopping Jerry, Jerry's from doing, interrupting what God was going to do by quoting. Jesus said, don't get in fear. And that word fear in the Greek is a word that's phobia, which it means bad connotation. Shrinking for fear, shrinking down, or it has the connotation flee or run away. You know that flee of a fight, run of a fight. That it has that connotation, and that's when Jesus told us, "Don't get in fear. Don't begin to shrink in fear. Don't begin to uh, uh, 
uh, let bad connotation come in you. Uh, don't look to run away because of the, the news that's being brought to you. And over there in Matthew 8 and 21, when the disciples was going to the other side and the storm come up, uh, 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 the scriptures say they went to wake Jesus up who had was taking a nap in the hinder part of the ship. And they woke him up and said, Jesus, do you care that we perish? He said, oh, ye of little faith. Why are you, first he said, oh, why are you so fearful, oh, ye of little faith? Why? Because that fear began to hinder their faith. And so Jesus was telling uh, Jairus, don't get in fear. Only believe. Only believe, Jairus. Don't get in fear. And that's what God is saying to you and I. Don't get in fear. Only believe God. Stand on the word when the bad news come. When we pray for someone and things seem to turn for the worse, you stand your ground. You continue to stand on the word of God. We're going to get ready to bring this message to a close as we continue to read the scripture. Jesus told Jairus, don't be afraid, only believe. The last thing I want to share with you out there in our viewing audience is out of Hebrews. Because the scripture tells us in Hebrews 3 and 12, let's go there and read it. And see what Paul was saying to the body of Christ as he related this message in the gospel of Hebrews. And it's Hebrews 3. And beginning... We're going to read a few verses of scripture here and we're going to get ready to close this message off. What is our subject is how to deal with bad news. We talked a lot about being careful with what we say because Jesus told Jairus. He didn't let him open his mouth. He said, Jairus, only believe. Jesus stepped right in when the bad news was being shared with Jairus. As the men who had come from his house was telling your daughter's dead, don't trouble the master. The master stepped in. Even though Jerry's faith was up a little bit because the woman with the issue of blood had been healed and he heard all that good news, yet he had another letdown. When the men from his home came and said, your daughter has expired, she's passed. And Jesus, before he could even open his mouth, said, hold up. He didn't say, hold up. He just said, Jerry, I can... Picture what Jesus did. Put his hand toward his mouth. Only believe. Don't be fearful. Only believe, Jairus. Don't be fearful. Only believe. Don't be afraid. Don't shrink in fear. Don't let negative connotation begin to flood your mind. Don't become fearful. Don't run away. Don't run away. You say he could, you can be standing up there and not be there. You can faint without falling to the ground you can all those things can happen to you because you've lost faith you've lost hope there's so many people that are walking around America now that are hopeless because they don't see no way out I'm here to tell you today Jesus is your way out he's still alive on planet earth and he is your way out I want to read this last scripture to you and further encourage you as a child of God of you even if you're not a child of God God is still for you he's not against you in Hebrew beginning at the first verse of the third chapter it reads and there's a few verses of scripture about 10 script 8 and 9 script he said wherefore holy brethren partakers of the heavenly calling consider the apostle and high priest of our profession Christ Jesus who was faithful to him that appointed him as also Moses was faithful in his in all his house. But this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who have built the house have more honor than the house. For every house is built by some man, but he that built all things is God. And Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. But Christ as a son of his own house, whose house are we, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope 
firm until the end. Hold on. What Jesus was telling Jairus. Hold on. You got the help with you. We going to your house. Your daughter going to be raised. And I'm telling you out there in our viewing audience. Hold on to the word of God. Hold on to your, your hope. Hope is confidence and in, in reassurance. That expectation of God to do something in your life. That's what hope is saying to you. Hold on to your expectation that God is going to do something positive in your life. That's just a one way of looking at hope. Firm unto the end. Wherefore as the Holy Ghost said today. If you will hear his voice. Harden not your heart. As in the provocation in the days of temptation in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me, proved me and saw my own works 40 years wherefore I was grieved with that generation and said they do always err and in their heart and they have not known my ways so I swore in my wrath they shall not enter into my rest they shall not enter into my rest take heed brethren lest there be in any of you any evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God and we're going to stop there what is he saying what is Paul saying Paul is saying those children of Israel that didn't enter into God's rest, they didn't enter because of unbelief. They didn't believe God. Even when the 12 spies came back and said, we're well able to take the land. We're well able. Two of them said that. But 10 of them said, no, there are giants over there. they are the sons of Anak over there. they are the, the giants over there. We can't take the land. And they are ten, that ten persuaded the rest of them to not believe God after God promised them a land of flowing with milk and honey. The two spies, Joshua and Caleb, said, We're well able to enter. They said, No, we'll be destroyed, and all of our children. And you know what God said? You're right, you would be destroyed. You're not going to enter into the land. I'm going to take the church now. The very children that you said, or would be destroyed. They are the ones that's going to go into the promised land. But because of unbelief, they didn't enter. What am I saying, saints? I want you to stay believing God. Trust God's word. Trust in God. And as Paul was saying to the Hebrews, enter into that rest. What is the rest? The rest is, I'm confident that God is, has already done the work. I'm not going to worry about it. I'm not going to be troubled. After I prayed about it and I believe God, I'm going to go in there and go to sleep. I'm going to rest at night. And when you come tell me when the doctor comes say things done turned for the worse, I'm going to say, hey, take that to God. Because God done told me healing is the children's bread and the prayer of faith shall save the sick. And if they've committed any sin, they shall be forgiven. And the Lord thy God will raise them up. That's what I'm standing on, the word of God. I'm not going to come off the word of God. I'm going to stand on the word of God. I'm at rest. Enter into that place of rest is what God is saying to you and I. Enter into that place of rest. What, what is the place of rest? I ain't going to worry about the situation. I done pray. I done put it in God's hand. I done cast it on Jesus. Like I said on my last uh, message, I cast all my cares on Jesus. I'm not worrying about it. I'm not going to worry about the children. I'm not going to worry about the relatives. I'm not going to worry about that uncle. I'm not going to worry about him. I done gave him to Jesus. That's where they're going to stay. I'm not going to bear this burden. The scripture said, take your burden to the Lord and what? Leave them there. Don't get them and take them back home with you. Leave them there. He's able to bear. He said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Well, take Jesus' yoke upon you. And leave them burdens there. Take his burden because his burdens are light. Enter into that place of rest, saints. You and I need to enter into that place of rest. Why? Because God has ordained for us to be at rest and at peace. When you worry about it, God takes his, his hands off it. When you stop worrying about it, God puts his hands on the situation. When you feel like you can do it, God say, I'll step back and let you do it. But when you say, I can't do it, I can't handle it, God said, leave it in my hands. I can handle it. I can do it. So that's what we got to do, saints. You are not my viewing audience. You who are watching this broadcast, God can do it. God can raise your loved one off that sick bed. 
who the doctor says she has COVID or he has COVID. Nothing is too hard for God. The scripture, if we ask the question, is there anything too hard for God? No, there's nothing too hard for God. If we dare to believe him, if we dare to stand on his word and begin to hold on to what? Our confession of faith. Don't let go of your confession of faith. Walk through your house saying, my sister is healed. My uncle is healed. My dad is healed. And don't let nobody say anything different that comes around you. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. Well, people are dying from COVID every day. I can't do nothing about that. My uncle not going to die. My daddy not going to die. My sister not going to die. My brother not going to die. My relative not going to die. Why? Because I prayed to my God. And my God said that prayer of faith shall save the sick. And if he committed sin, or if she committed sin, they shall be forgiven. And my God shall raise them up. I believe my God and confessed it. And over then, uh, 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 Hebrew 10, it said, hold on to what? Your confession of faith. Don't let go of your confession of faith. Why? Because there's power in your tongue. Jesus didn't let Jerry say anything because Jesus knew the power of Jerry's tongue. So when Jesus got to Jerry's house, when all the, the, the people, the relatives there that were crying, not the professional singers, but the relatives, that was there crying and weeping and making a do. And Jesus said, she's not dead, she just sleep. He put them all out. He said, put them out and let me go in and pray. And Jesus went in and prayed and raised Jerry's daughter. But he didn't let Jerry say a word. He let Jerry see what it's all about when you practice the religion of being silent. Sometimes we gotta practice the religion of being silent and not opening our mouth in every situation, especially when we are getting a negative uh, uh, situation that's not favorable to us. When we're hearing words that are not favorable, sometimes don't let the first thing come out your mouth, just be silent. Put a guard over your mouth, put, put your hand over your mouth. Don't open your mouth when you hear some bad news because what come out your mouth gonna set the tone, gonna establish some principles. So don't open your mouth, just be silent. Folks ask for your comment on it, say, I don't have one. I'm believing God. Right now, I'm, I'm turning to Jesus, and I'm consulting with him, and I'm going to hear his words. Well, I think I've said enough. Well, there's always more that could be said concerning the word of God, because there's a lot in the word of God that we could share. But I thank God for you tuning in to the broadcast, and I want to pray for you, and I want to believe God with you. I'm not just talking to you. I hear these words myself and I'm preaching to myself as well as I'm preaching to those in the audience and you who are viewing this broadcast. Let's just go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I thank you for all our viewing audience. We give praise and honor for it. And Lord, I know many of them are facing some difficult situation. Probably have loved ones who have come down with COVID and they are concerned. They have allowed that spirit of worry to grip them. They are listening to all that negative news about COVID and hearing all the bad things. And many of them may not have rent money or grocery money. Many of them don't see a way out. But you said it in your word, I am the way, I am the truth, I am, I am the life. My Jesus is the truth, he's the way, and he's the life. And I wanna pray that you turn your attention and focus to Jesus. When the children of Israel were being snake bitten in the wilderness and God told Moses to raise up this statue with this serpent on it and tell the people to look up and live. That's what I want to tell you today. I want you to look to the cross because it's in the cross that old song that say, I, when I first saw the light and the burdens of my heart roll away, it was there by faith I received my sight. And now I'm happy all the days. Look to the cross. And I want to encourage you to look to the cross. Not because Jesus is up there, but because the cross is empty. He's come down off the cross and he's sitting at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for you, saying, Father, meet that need for my sister. Heal that loved one. Meet that grocery need. Provide a meal, Father. 
Provide rent for them. Lord, in Jesus' name, I touch and agree with all those in our viewing audience. And I pray in the name of Jesus, Father, that that need be met. Whatever the need is, whether it's physically, whether it's spiritually, whether it's mentally or emotionally, whether they just need deliverance. I rebuke that burden that's sitting on their soul. I rebuke that oppression. I rebuke that spirit of fear. I come against it in the name of Jesus. And I command that devil to loose them. I command that burden to lift up off of them right now in the name of Jesus. And I pray that the joy of the Lord which is our strength begin to flow up their spirit and let them know, Father, that they have no reason to be sad, to be uh, in doubt or to feel a dread, but they can know that the peace of God which surpass all their understanding gathers around their mind right now. In the precious and awesome name of Jesus, fill their spirit, their mind, their soul with peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Right now in the name of Jesus we pray. Every need being met, we decree it and declare it in Jesus' name. And I thank God for you tuning in this day. May God bless you and may God keep you. And may God meet every need you have. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Jackson, for that word. It's such a wonderful thing that we can gather together as family and that we can fellowship and feast upon the word of God. Well, at this time, once again, it is offering time. And here at Harvest Rain Church, we have three ways which you can give. First, you can use our text to give. Second, you can use the website at harvestrain.org. Lastly, you can mail it in. And all of that information should appear right there on your screen below. Well, at this time, I'd like to go to uh, one of my favorite passages. It's Proverbs chapter 3, starting at the ninth verse. And it reads, Honor the Lord with thy substance, and with the first fruits of all thine increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty, and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. Amen. As you come in, as you're bringing your offerings, your tithes before the Lord, come before the Lord with your first fruits of all your increase. This year, God has been good to each and every one of us. We know we've had some troubled times this year, but in this season, I'm so thankful that God has brought us through to this time. So as you're gathering together with your family and you're celebrating, just think about how good the Lord has been to you. And I want at this time for you to get that offering, get that seed in your hand. And as you reflect back upon this year, think about how good God has been. Amen? Amen. Well, let us pray. Most gracious and heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for this offering, Lord God, for this seed that we're going to give, Lord God. Father, you've blessed us, Lord God, tremendously throughout this year, Lord God. And Father, as we celebrate, Lord God, tomorrow, Lord God, Father God, we celebrate you, Lord God. We give thanks to you, Lord God. For you are the creator of the heavens and the earth. You are the great I am. And so as we give this offering, as we give this seed, Lord God, Father, we give you honor. We give you praise. We give you glory. And we just thank you, Lord God, for the bountiful blessings, Lord God, that you have opened and bestowed upon us, Lord God, your children, Lord God. So, Father, we give you praise. We give you honor and glory. And we thank you. And it's in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 We would like to thank you once again for tuning in to our broadcast. And here at Harvest Rain Church, from our family to yours, we would like to say a happy Thanksgiving.